Hey, Maya. Hey. Yeah, today I'm talking to my friend Amaya, who is difficult to describe. I think that you're <laughs> you're hard to categorize. How would you how would you present yourself? <laughs> it's so funny that you mentioned that because the other day I was um, I was at a cafe and and one woman asks me, "So what do you do?" And it's like such a dreaded question for me and. Thank God another woman, she came to my rescue and she was like, no, 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 she can't really explain it. You just have to experience it. I'm <laughs> like, I like that. I think I'm going to stick with that. Um, yeah, like depending on which day you ask me, I could give a different answer as to what I think it is that I'm doing. Um, I like to deep dive in my psyche and kind of bring back the gold and you know share with people what I find in this journey of being human and our our neuroses and how it all plays out and then just kind of share my perspectives on how I work my way out of certain neuroses and into back into sanity and ease. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> And you're also a writer. And Wri writing is my is my instrument. Yeah. 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 It seems like lately you've been transforming more into a kind of mentor or teacher role. You could say that, but again, it's you know, I can only say that I'm just being myself, and I I might take on a certain role or figure for people depending on how they want to relate to me. I wouldn't call myself a teacher or a mentor. I mean, I've tried different avenues. I've also tried coaching in a way, not calling it coaching, but definitely doing that. And it didn't feel right. I can only say, you know, I discover certain things and perspectives and I share them and they seem to be really helpful for a lot of people and also mm -hmm really triggering for a lot of other people or useless mm. and that's fine too yeah yeah what experiences have you found with your work being triggering for people i'm curious about that it happens less than i anticipate that it that it would that's that's very interesting um it's triggering or confronting in the sense that the bigger the perspective that you share, the less people are kind of supposed to see what you're talking about. Hmm. So I do always hmm. try and bridge as much as I can. But a lot of what I share comes down to a level of self-responsibility that completely pulls you out of any kind of fear and lack and victim mentality into complete sovereignty mm. and that understandably could potentially upset a lot of people because it's a big responsibility yeah 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 I think that the victimization is like a pressure release mm-hmm because people are overwhelmed with the, the fear, the stress of their life circumstance. So if you're able to blame something else for that, then yeah. it, yeah, it releases psychological pressure Absolutely. that otherwise would be fully on yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, but it's also, I think you would agree, very empowering to take responsibility for your own experiences and your own circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one of my favorite catchphrases is, you know, with great power comes great responsibility, but only with great responsibility co comes great power. The more you mm -hmm. can say for everything that you experience, every thought you have, every feeling, every action, anything that shows up in your life, you just take responsibility for how you relate to it. That's where your only power lies. What do you think of the paradox of taking full responsibility and assuming control for all of your behaviors and reactions at the same time as 
trusting the guidance and authority of some kind of higher power, whether Mm. you want to call it the universe. Because Mm -hmm. I think that those things are coexistent, but they're also, you could perceive them as a paradox. Because Mm -hmm. on one hand, you're claiming that everything is, is happening through the will of the universe and on the other hand you're claiming that everything happens through my choices as an individual mm-hmm. self I love that question it's uh, it's not one that I can claim to have any kind of definitive answer to um, but I do know that paradoxes in the way that we think of paradoxes don't usually they don't actually really exist it's more that our mind is, our brain is set up in such a way that we like to say it's this or that. If it's this, that it cannot be that. But that's actually not true because there is there is layers of awareness. There's layers of existence. Um, and usually, the higher up you go in your awareness, and and the more you will see that everything is true from a certain perspective, and that they don't have to exclude each other. So what I hear um, you ask about is kind of this, this age-old question of do we have free will or mm-hmm. is everything predetermined? I believe kind of in both at the same time, which is a very hard thing to explain. Um, I can feel and I can sense that life is wanting to move through us in a certain way. You could call it predestined, but it's not predestined predestination in the way that we think predestination is not like fatalistic like this is going to happen at this day it's more like if you have a seed it's going to grow into something but a lot of variables will determine when and how and the quality and the surroundings you know and then how I see free will we absolutely have free will but I can also see that our free will comes down to two choices. It's to align yourself with how life wants to move through you, which is not just the best for everything and everyone, it's also the best for you. Or you can swim against the stream, against the current. And this is why life feels so hard for so many people, because we're utilizing our free will from a place of ego and fear. So we have a choice. Basically, I I like to make things simple. You can either choose from a place of trust and surrender and love or from a place of fear and ego. That's, for me, the only free choice we have. All the rest is just details, you know. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter so much, do I say this thing or this thing? The only choice is, do I consider love in my response or do I consider self-preservation first and foremost? Mm. Yeah. Before we started recording, <clears throat> you were talking about something along the lines of following your heart mm-hmm. or following your inner guidance, which I think is related to this concept because you were talking about life having a suggestion yeah. for how <clears throat> we are best meant to follow it, sort of like the Tao or the way that is set out for all of us and some people seem to have an easier time than others at being able to follow that and I'm curious for you if you could talk about that in and of itself and also what that looks like like how can somebody recognize when the path is being they're being guided to a certain path and what does it look like when people don't follow that accurately and how can one align themselves to that Mm -hmm. yeah I think what I mentioned to you before was you know you following the path of your heart you living your life's purpose you know those are kind of two ways of saying the same thing as far as I'm concerned Um, It comes down to what you value most, you know, do you value most to kind of think about your future and to think what do I want to do and to think how do I generate security 
and income, or maybe success and a reputation, or I let, I'm willing to let everything completely go and see what moves through me. So that's kind of what we spoke about, like not a whole lot of people are willing to throw themselves in the abyss. Uh, we hire coaches and, and mentors and this and that to help us kind of bridge the abyss. Or we have day jobs to keep us safe. I'm not saying that there is anything wrong with that. I'm just saying how I've done things and which made it easier to let my life's purpose li you know, live through me and to follow my heart because I didn't give myself another option. I didn't give myself a plan B. I didn't give myself a back door. I didn't give myself a safety net. Um, and people have often asked me, how do you get the courage to do that? Or you're so brave. And I said, not really. I'm just sensitive enough to my own suffering that I know that if I don't follow my heart, but if, but if I follow my fear, like what, I'm, what, what should I do rather than what do I truly want to do, I suffer. I think we all do, but it takes a kind of um, either sensitivity or honesty with yourself that for some people needs cultivating. For other people, maybe more like you and I, it's kind of built in, which makes us live um, a more difficult life, usually the first 20, 30 years, until we figure out like, well, it was really hard for us because we didn't fit in and we didn't have any other options. And yet, I don't end up being 40, 50, 60, 70 years old and still not having really figured out why I'm here, what I'm supposed to do. Mm. Yeah, I think that our life experiences teach us. And mm -hmm. like you said, I've certainly experienced when I have had the, the nudge from my intuition or from my inner guidance to take a certain course, to take a certain action that I didn't actually follow. It's mm -hmm. usually from a place of fear yeah. that stifles my action around that or I get into my head and I overthink things and I consider it too much. I rationalize things because oftentimes the decisions that are the most appealing to us in our heart with that felt sense are not really rationally what mm -hmm. appears to be the best decision. Nope. If Some... it makes sense, that it's not your intuition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the mind wants to take control of the, you know, wants to sail the ship. Mm -hmm. And the times when I've followed that instead of the less rational, more intuitive impulse, it's resulted in suffering for sure. And I think that something that you probably went through is you probably went through that to a point where by doing that and suffering, you eventually said, I'm not going to do this anymore. Like, I need to follow my inner guidance or else it's going to cause me too much harm. I can't say that um, that was the path for me so much with um, following my heart and living my life's purpose. It's just like, like there's a level of sensitivity to my integrity and authenticity that I've never been able to deny, which is why I, yeah, life in a way was part suffering because others didn't accept that I was so um, adamant about really following my heart and really doing me. But that is exactly the journey that I've had to make with my, my mental and emotional health and stability, you know, I, I, I found the exact same formula, which is certain things just make you suffer over and over and over again. I need to investigate this. <clears throat> I need to be more honest with myself. Mm. If I don't want to keep repeating the same patterns and the same loops. Mm. I find a lot of people have a lot of resistance to fear around a difficulty in living authentically. Mm -hmm. 
a lot of people seem to predicate their decisions on the perceptions of other people. For example, I'm going to start this career because it will give me this level of status and then I will be loved by other people or something like that or I'll be seen as cool. You know, so a lot of people seem to make those kinds of decisions that engenders a level of kind of fakeness or like a, a level of disassociation from their true character as opposed to what society might impose on them. And um, how, how do you think that somebody in that kind of a position, first of all, what, what creates that in people? And secondly, how can that be transformed mm. in people? How does it, how, why, how and why does it start and occur? Um, well, it's just like any other shadow frequency, you know? It's unconscious behavior that makes total sense. It's part of the bigger plan, you know? Like, we all have had to come to thresholds in our lives where we see, like, oh, I've been doing this my whole life, but it's not actually me. It's just a, a pattern that um, originated out of insert any kind of word here all points to the same thing in a different way it all comes from fear conditioning ancestral trauma um, um, societal standards doesn't really matter it's just it's a shadow of frequency it's an unconscious frequency and how do you get out of that well life will force you if not this lifetime then another lifetime like you have to want it enough and if if you're doing unconscious things, you are suffering, always. Ignorance is not bliss. Mm -hmm. But a lot of us have not fully waken, woken up to how much we're actually suffering. There's this quote that I have no idea where it comes from. It might just be an Ubudi, it might be some guru, I don't know, but I really relate to it, which is, um, if you're suffering, then it just means you haven't suffered enough. And how I relate to that is uh -huh. a certain amount of suffering will definitely wake you up. Yeah. And no amount of coaching, no amount of inspirational videos, no amount of, you know, gurus uh, is, is going to change your mind until you're like, fuck, I'm suffering. Yeah. And that's the moment when you start to wake up from your suffering. Yeah. <laughs> so the way I see it, like there's... There's so much going on in the world. There's so much going on in individuals. And everyone seems to be really worried, especially about the world. And I'm like, I'm not, because I see that it's a natural progression. We need to make it really bad for ourselves to really wake up. Right. Humans, for the most part, have a very limited perspective yep. on their own <laughs> lives and life in general. Yep. And, yeah, oftentimes things that can seem the most disastrous to either our lives individually or collectively yeah. can actually be of the greatest benefit mm -hmm. and it's yeah suffering is our greatest teacher and it's also that which most forcefully can awaken us yeah but you know like an example is how nazi germany was one of the most repressive cultures in our history but yet like Germany now, especially Berlin and places like that, it's like the freest place in the world mm. for all kinds of sexual expression and racial diversity and you can be any kind of freak you want. And mm. I think that that is, yeah, an interesting example of what can occur in our own lives. People that generally experience really intense difficulties at a certain age in their life have an ability through those sh those perceived shortcomings to use that as fuel to propel them actually farther than other people who may have not experienced the same difficulties would get to. Mm -hmm. And then there is other people with the same kind of troubled past or, uh, yeah, past or history that 
keep, rem you know, they remain in this um, victim frequency most of their lives and point towards their past as, well, I've had it really difficult. So I, I have reason to, you know, not grow and blossom and become conscious. I have reason to complain and be fearful. Yes, you do. But you have just as much reason to actually wake up and be the change. Mm -hmm. um, this is the thing, you know, like it's whatever raw material you're handed. It's 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 about what you do with it always. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of people have an addiction to their stories yes. and to their their patterns They're literally addictions because Absolutely. they create a kind of psychological home base for people. Yeah. So people have lived so long in a state of victimhood, for example, that that becomes the known and that becomes comfortable, that to venture outside of that is freaky. It's, it's, it's like taking off your shell mm -hmm. and it's vulnerable to venture outside of that. And also there's like deep neurological grooves that get formed too with yeah. certain thought patterns and associations and yeah. our and our egos. Yeah, and, and it's about having experiences which can catalyze a transformation to occur. Probably for some of those people an experience of transcendence where they are outside of the story and outside of their sense of individuality to be able to see how liberating and pleasurable that kind of a sensation is may make them realize, wow, I've been living in this prison in my mind mm -hmm. and I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And now I need to, I have to discard those habits because they're not actually serving me to be fulfilled and happy. But yeah, that's something that I, I find interesting not only from my examination of myself but of other people too is what enables people to change you know like what kinds of experiences or ingredients arise in people's lives that really enables them for profound transformations not just like superficial things but but real transformation um, I think the way, the way I phrased this before is all roads lead to home. Um, I've seen people transform through an ayahuasca ceremony. I've also seen people do hundreds of ayahuasca ceremonies and not change a single thing. I've seen people yeah, me do meditation retreats and come out completely profound or not. Um, this is why I do what I do. I kind of share from a frequency, from a perspective that helps people align their mind to an awareness beyond their current awareness. And not with the idea of people need to change and people are going to change, but to kind of show like change is possible and it doesn't always have to be in intense ways or it doesn't have to use any kind of measure outside of yourself even um, if, even for now i'm just categorizing even stuff like meditation in in that category literally you can lie on your couch and have a death and rebirth experience you can have that in any moment if you're willing to go deep enough into your pain mm -hmm. so my path with all of this was to actually exhaust my mind so far that it kind of imploded. I exhausted my pain to such a point that it imploded on me. Yeah. You know, and I tried a lot of different ways before. Nothing worked. Nothing worked um, on the level of the root of the core. The only thing for me that made any lasting change and impact was to be in so much pain and in so much suffering that it just, it transformed on its own. Like the willingness to really feel it and to not walk away from your human experience, to not walk away from your human story. Transcendence in a way by going fully into the experience first instead of kind of wanting to leave it behind. 
straight away to overcome it it's 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 the feminine way you know it's not letting go it's not moving on it's not being beyond something it's going so deep into the stories and into the suffering that you see that it's not actually truly there to begin with it's only because we don't look at it it's because we don't go into our suffering we don't go into our pain aka we chronologically i'm sorry we chronically suffer low-key instead of suffer so much that it it awakens us yeah that was that was my way and it's it's not for everyone because like i said i think all roads lead to home in the end it doesn't really matter so much but for me for myself what i've come to notice is that the more i seek an end of my suffering the more lessons I will have to have in suffering and the more I accept how human I am and that suffering is part of the journey and that ups and downs are part of the journey and that my pain is not something to turn away from but when I turn towards it it reveals what it's truly about I don't know I just I I haven't seen a more potent or more effective or more efficient way that works from the ground up you know, it, it includes our human material. So we end up with a, a higher perspective, a higher awareness, but not an awareness that makes the human experience drag us back again and again. Because mm-hmm. that's what I see with a lot of paths that are more about transcendence. Yeah. Is that whenever something human comes up, we lose our shit. Or like, no, I don't want to feel that. Yeah. It's, it's like what Ram Dass said about he spent years and years getting high <sighs> and then he changed his orientation from wanting to get high and that includes like not just getting high on drugs but getting yeah. high through meditation yeah, yeah, through yoga yeah. whatever to getting free oh, because every beautiful. single time and i experienced this too and i'm becoming i guess more to some degree frustrated with it as it perpetuates but you have a, a high whether that's through a psychedelic experience or falling in love or mm-hmm. a meditation <laughs> experience or whatever but then you come down always you always come down and through the comparison of from the high to the come down there's always suffering there mm-hmm. and you know he experienced that to a really extreme degree by taking psychedelics hundreds and hundreds of times to the point where he he was fed up with that decided that he didn't want to chase the high but more to get liberated from from the patterns of suffering mm-hmm. and I think we all go through this on a spiritual journey many many times and I used to think oh I did it wrong or others are doing it wrong and through this um, really beautiful stumbling and falling a million times we start to learn what the true spiritual journey is which is it's not about transcending your humanness but it's actually finding freedom in your suffering finding freedom in your pain finding freedom you know the moment you give up truly if you were to truly give up any movement towards wanting to be free you would be free Mm -hmm. if you truly if you truly surrendered, you'd be enlightened right here, right now. And that's that's always your measure in kind of gauging how honest you are. Anytime you say, I, I, I want peace, I want to be at peace. Well, if you're not at peace, then that's how much you mean it or not mean it. If you say, I want peace, you would be at peace if you meant it. And that's what I'm practicing in my life these days. And it's it's a daily practice, pretty much. Um, of my value of like I want freedom mental emotional freedom but I am the only one who can give that to me life is not going to give it to me my relationships are not going to give it to me because they're never going to be perfect it's up to me to see the perfection in the imperfection it's up to me to choose peace regardless of whether other people are peaceful towards me or not Hmm. And this is this becomes self mastery, or the way I like to call it, self artistry. Um, to know what you want on a deepest level, and on a deepest level, we all just want to be free, which is the same as we want to know that we are love. 
You know, we want to relax. We want to know that everything is already taken care of. Everything is already settled. We can relax. We're safe. We're good. But because we want to know that, we create infinite drama for ourselves. So we have to keep digging towards the root and saying, if I want to know that I'm free, if I want to have peace beyond anything else, I need to keep myself aligning to that. Mm. And then whatever shows up in my life is an opportunity. Even if it seems like adversity, it's an opportunity for me to practice that amount of peace. And every time you do, the universe responds like, okay, I see that you mean it. And you, you're telling yourself like, oh, I mean it. And I actually have that ability to hold peace, to be free. Mm. If you stay down on your knees, then life can't knock you over. This <laughs> is like an inner quality of, of humility, of... Yeah. Yeah, I think what, there's... What Ram Dass also went, went through, like... He wanted to get high, and every time he had to come down, well, if you just stay down, but in a very... Like, in a humble way, is what, what I mean. You know, if you want to get high every time on life, and this is what everyone wants, this is what everyone seeks... Um, every time they have a conflict with someone, they want the other person to fix it so that they can feel like, okay, my life is at peace. We go to yoga, we go to meditate. We do all everything we do it because we want to get high. Mm -hmm. We want to feel the way we want to feel instead of just saying, I'm going to choose to accept everything as it is. And that's that's a path of getting high, but it's a sustainable high. It's from the ground up. It's a very humbling kind of high. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's an amazing Buddhist teacher named Chogun Trumpa Rinpoche who was really influential. He left Tibet in the 1950s and came to the U.S. and established the first Tibetan Buddhist centers. But he talks a lot about this, which is that he tells his students to give up. Yeah. And Beautiful. the idea... Is that, yeah, meditation is not going to remove suffering nope. in the way that people think it is. It's like we are... Makes you aware of your suffering. Yeah. <laughs> it's basically like we're, everything we do, we're walking on razor blades and like we go to sleep and we're laying down on a bed of razor blades <laughs> and like we're constantly trying to disassociate our minds from that reality. Yeah. And... It's to accept the fact that this dimension, this reality that we live in is like walking on that, <laughs> that, you know, bed of razor blades that like, no matter what, like it, there's, it's going to suck a little bit. Like it's going to, like, there's, it's going to hurt. Like that's what life is, you know, and to, instead of chasing all these things to run away from that and trying to fix that, you can't fix that. You can't escape that to like really turn and to greet that. Mm. And to embrace that that's, that's the case. That no matter what I do, there's, I, could have a, I could have $7 billion in my bank account. Yep. And it's not going to change that. So I hurt. could have a harem of the most beautiful women and it's not going <laughs> to change that. Like, it, it, nothing I do is going to change that. Like, there's going to be suffering here until you just embrace that fact. Yes, and then bring it down from those really lofty <clears throat> examples that you gave and then bring it down to the mundane. Why do people create so many interpersonal relational issues? Because they think that the pain that they're feeling, the razor blades, they think it's you. Yeah. It's you. It's you doing this to me. It's you doing this to me. Okay, if I can just fix this little issue with this person and then... And it never seems to work. But this is the one thing that, um, that people don't really seem to get. That your inner agitation, your inner unrest, restlessness, frustration, all of it, it doesn't come from outside of you. It comes from the inside. But we're trying to put out fires everywhere. Whether it's your job, or your money, or your possessions, and of course most fun and spectacular one all of our relationships and yeah. this is why why relationships are so hard because 
we make all of our problems about someone else instead of continuously turning inwards like the suffering is already there and mm. again to be humbled by that suffering to be able to be present with your inner suffering and the more you do that the less you will feel the need to project it out onto someone else and to make your suffering their suffering mm -hmm. and the more you do that it's like wow all of a sudden all of my relationships are drama free because I deal with my own suffering on the inside and I know that no, no matter what anyone says or does or n doesn't say or do doesn't change anything about the amount of suffering that's already there that's the illusion mm -hmm. if you were to just change your tone of voice a little bit then I would be happy um, if you were to just call me then I would feel safe if you were to just change this or this or this about your being then I would find true happiness this is how we operate but we're not we don't have that level of awareness and honesty with ourselves mm, yet. yeah but this is um, yeah this is my highest practice these days to take that level of self-responsibility and and not pretend that my suffering is outside of me mm. it can be fixed outside of me because it I've tried that a lot of times <laughs> and I failed miserably. Yeah. Yeah, and so much of our relationship seems to play out these patterns that we develop when we're babies because it's like when I was a toddler, I threw this temper tantrum and that made my mom really attentive to me and then that made me feel safe and safe and loved. So then we we internalize that that I don't feel safe and loved. How do I get that? It's, oh, it's through having an emotional reaction that caused my parents to be extra attentive to me. Mm -hmm. And then we end up playing out those patterns in our intimate relationships, you know, because it's how we associate getting that need of love or safety or whatever it is met. Rather than acknowledging this, uh, this feeling of, I don't feel safe, I don't feel loved. And not necessarily putting that, from? yeah, and not yeah. even putting that on the other person, not saying you're making me feel unsafe, you're making me feel unloved, but just saying, I don't feel safe, I don't feel loved. And then being able to communicate that, you know, being able to share that rather than that occurs on an unconscious level and then some kind of pattern occurs on an unconscious level because you think that that's going to fix that, but really just being able to gauge how you actually feel and look inward mm. and then being able to communicate that to the other person. Yeah, a level of vulnerability and revealing yourself. Yeah, I found it, I found that very um, freeing somehow. I think we're all running away from what we most need and one of those things is vulnerability. You Absolutely. Know, we're, we're hiding behind so many um, masks and then because we do that, then at a certain point we need to snap in a relationship and be like, well, you're not seeing who I am, you're not seeing what I need, you're not giving me what I want. It's like, well, it's hard to gauge those things if you're not vulnerable, if you're not showing um, how sensitive you are or in how much pain you are. And then, yeah, then we get, get ourselves into this dynamic of now, now there's a finger pointing. Well, you are not treating me right. Like, well... You didn't reveal how you were actually feeling and what you were needing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and most of what we need usually is actually just to be seen. Absolutely. Very, very little is, is truly needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's so much resistance to being vulnerable and real and authentic in Western culture. It might be different in Holland, I'm not sure, but especially in California, you know, where I grew up. The question, how are you doing? Oh, not a real yeah. not a real question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's totally. like to just it's just a you know, polite it's a reflex. Yeah, it's it's just it's it's not a. In a if somebody's like, man, like, 
I feel terrible, mm-hmm. you know? Like, I just had this huge fight with my wife. Like, I, I feel awful. People would be like, oh, okay. And it would make them uncomfortable, and they would want to stray away from that. The, and, other, the other day, someone I just met asked me, how are you? And I started crying. I, and she loved it, you know? She gave me a hug, and we're just sitting there and, and looking each other in the eye for a bit. And, I mean, it sounds very fluffy when I say it like this. But it's so... It's so endearing and, and to, yeah, to really see our humanness and our imperfections. And this is something that, that, that's making me... This is one of the hardest things for me lately that can re- make me really sad, which is that I see humans expecting perfection from other humans. And... I'm pretty sure me phrasing it in this way, not everyone will recognize that this is what they do, but I see it all the time. It's mm-hmm. like, you're not perfect. I'm going to rub it in. And right. this is, you know, where, where are we indoctrinated with this? With the church. You're born a sinner, and now you need to repent for all your sins. Mm-hmm. And you need to be baptized, otherwise you won't get into heaven. Even the ones of us that have not been raised religiously, myself included, but I can see this is how everyone in society operates. We go about our days and we see fault everywhere. And we point fingers. And why? Because what we truly want is perfect love. Why? Because that's our true nature. It's source. What we want is source, is to remember that we're one with source. But we're trying to find that in the world of duality and form. So because we have this aching, this deep longing, this sacred longing to remember what true love is, what it feels like, then we go around pointing at everyone, you're not it, you're not it, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, instead of just recognizing perfect love, I can only have that experience when... I take all these imperfect people and all these imperfect opportunities and take them as an opportunity for me to extend love, Mm. to see your innocence, to see your beauty underneath your mask of personality, underneath the mask, the appearance of all your imperfections. And Mm. this is, this has sometimes happened to me um, at random times, it felt like grace descending upon me and in like really random situations sitting at the DMV, for example, and I'm just looking around and I just cry. I see God everywhere. And those are moments, those, those, those happen to me. You can't make it happen. But I've used those moments in my normal day-to-day life to remember there is a way you can look out into the world. There is a way you can look at people and increase your experience of source, of love. And it's not through judgment. It's not through telling people how they're wrong and how they should change. We think that that's how we get love, but it's the absolute opposite. It's putting conditions on something that doesn't have conditions. And so it becomes, yeah, the the task of bridging the two worlds because we are human and we live in a world of duality and we live in a world of perfectly imperfect humans and relationships, but there is a realm of perfect love. Mm -hmm. And to rest your awareness in that higher realm and to bring it back down here, that's, yeah, that's where it's at for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that perfection exists only as an expectation in the mind and people get upset with other people when they don't fulfill their expectations Mm -hmm. but yeah if you are able to get to a perspective and i've had experiences of these states of consciousness which unfortunately are transitory but to be able to see the world without the constructs of the mind imposed upon it to just allow life and the world to be as it is then you really do see how much we suffer from our expectations and our stories you know it happens a lot in intimate relationships 
you know, like I expect my girlfriend to be like this and then your actual partner doesn't behave like your expectation of how in your mind you believe that your girlfriend is supposed to behave and Mm -hmm. then you get upset (laughs) when in actuality they're just not living up to a story and people do this all the time they get upset when people don't live up to their stories yeah and I think you opened this with we expect perfection yes but the perfection is actually already there we just expect we don't actually expect perfection because perfection is already there we prospect a certain very incredibly narrow idea of personal perfection and that can only come from fear you could say we don't actually recognize perfection yeah yeah because it already it already exists life is and and the universe and this infinitely complex system that we are all integrated into is doing great yeah it's it's doing its thing it's been doing its thing since (laughs) beginningless time and yeah it's it's perfect that's why i think it's so so incredible to just consider for a moment and and hopefully more and more each day to realize that your awareness is incredibly limited and that gives me a big relief because if it were up to humans we would go out into nature and we would tell bananas to be straight and we would start campaigns and we would start petitioning and we would ask our friends like you you agree with me right bananas should be straight and then everyone's like yeah yeah yeah, you're right you're implying that bananas are gay (laughs) (laughs) and this is the same what we do with humans we're like well you're a little bit crooked and i actually you should be straight I'm just going to be honest with you here. I'm just going to really honestly reflect on you. you you're, 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 you're a crooked banana and you should be straight or a mm. bent banana. Yeah, much <sighs> like recognizing and making peace with the suffering that is inherent, making peace with the humanness of people, yeah. that all people have shadow qualities and all people have virtues. Sure. And I think it, I would even go so far as to say it's tricky to say um, we all have shadows because unless you have done a really fair amount of inner work and lifted out of your shadows in a way that people don't trigger you anymore, even when they are in your shadow, you cannot accurately determine if someone is in your shadow. If right. you react to someone, if you have an emotional reaction or if you judge them, that means you're at the same shadow frequency and it's not really up for you, mm. up to you to decide what they should do with that or that they should change it. It's still for you first to do your inner work. A lot of people come to me with questions of like, well, but my partner or my friend is doing this and this and this and this. Like, obviously I'm right, right? They're wrong, right? I'm like, well, you can be wrong. you can be right or you can be free you can have a level of inner freedom regardless of their behavior. Only from that point, I would ever suggest to give a suggestion to another person. But the thing is, if you have inner freedom, you're much less likely to go around and tell people that they're in their shadow or that their behavior is wrong. Because you know it's part of their personal evolution. And for you to want to change them or tell them the truth, that means you still have an agenda. Mm -hmm. Which means you're in a way at at the same frequency Mm. yeah i feel like all of this can be to some degree resolved by a surrendering into (laughs) just to say whatever whatever you got life like i'm i'm grateful i'm cool with it Mm -hmm. and however people show up it's cool (laughs) Careful what you wish for. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I've been sharing a certain, a similar sentiment with the universe, as in just give me all you got, and in a sense also like as a way to accelerate my growth, to to just throw me into the fire, to to burn away all of the small personal grievances because. I don't have time to be triggered every day. I don't have time. I mean, I've done extended amounts of uh, extended periods of um, 
dark nights of the soul and I'm coming out of it and doing a lot of inner work and I'm at a point where I'm like I want to be free so for that I in every situation I need to remember as soon as I can to surrender to accept mm. to see the falsity of emotional reactions and mental loops and again it always comes down to this question do you want to be right or do you want to be free um and then life shows me how little work I still need to do. And, and the things that I do need to work on, they're big. Mm. I, I will go into suffering for like four weeks on end. It's like, okay, this was a big one. I was not ready to surrender because we use words like surrender pretty easily. But in truth, if you were to live in a state of surrender, you would live completely free, untriggered, unfazed, no emotional charge, no upsets. That's the truth of it. Right. So again, it, it becomes this thing. You always know how honest you are. We use certain words like surrender and acceptance, um, almost kind of like a cheat code. Yeah, 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 don't worry. I'm, I'm surrendering, universe. Please give me back my inner peace. Yeah, 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 I'm accepting of this, this drama. Why do we accept? Because we want to be above it. But again, you can only accept by really going into it and then having this little implosion of where you're like, you see the amount of suffering that you create for yourself. And in doing so, it's just like something pops. Hmm. Yeah, I'd really, I'd really like to hear what going into the pain looks like or means for you, because that's something that seems... <laughs> quite easy to say in words but the actual mechanisms of that occurring might be more difficult to <laughs> ascertain absolutely and at the same time it's um it's trying to explain an acid trip to someone that's never done acid <laughs> or a dmt trip right. um i can only point towards what what it's like it will never ever Um, do anything for someone it, it's, it's literally like you know, literally it's literally dying for your ego not for anything else it's dying it's a, a de death process for the part of you that is most afraid to die so let's see if you're a little kid and you're afraid of the dark, and you're afraid of monsters under the bed. It's kind of, it's, it's, it's similar to you looking under the bed and seeing that nothing is there. But as a kid, you can imagine how scary that would be, right? Yeah. Well, it's the same with turning towards your fear, turning towards your pain. You really have to go so for me I, I do use my my body a lot for this I become present with all the sensations and instead of trying to pacify myself instead of trying to tell myself it's okay and create mental stories to get me out of my suffering I try and descend into the pain so Let's say you're afraid of something, a scenario. Instead of trying to come up with scenarios that make you less afraid, you actually go into the image in your head. Why am I so afraid of that? And you're like, you come up with like the next scenario. You know, let's say, um, why are you afraid of losing your job? Well, because then I wouldn't have any money. Okay, but what, what would be so scary about that? Well... I could end up living on the street. Okay, imagine that. And then you imagine living on the street and how bad and all that would be. And then you simply track all the feelings and all the emotions in your body. And you can do this with any scenario because any shadow comes out of fear. So fear is always at the basis. And it's a process of stepping towards the fear letting the sensations in your body that are uncomfortable as fuck to let them become bigger and bigger and at a certain point you can detach the complete story from it because the truth is 
all of these stories, every little problem you have in your life is not the actual story. The fear is already in your body. The discomfort is already there. And everything that happens in your life is just another manifestation of the same root. And this is not something you do once or twice as a little party trick. This is a way of life to always turn more towards your fear, your pain and discomfort. And what I personally found after just a few months of doing that consciously was that I had an an insane experience of death and rebirth. I recorded part of my crying. It sounded like, I don't know, it was otherworldly. It's it's on my underphone though. That was me going so deep into my pain that when I stopped crying that afternoon, I knew something has now shifted. Like on in my in my you know cellularly, uh, physiologically, mentally, emotionally in my life, and it was true. I went about the rest of my life, and something had shifted, not just a little bit, but like a quantum leap. Mm. Yeah. I've experienced that in ayahuasca ceremonies or on various psychedelic medicines, and it seems that. For myself personally and for a lot of people, it's hard to go to those places without some kind of catalyst like a psychedelic, Hmm. you know. For me, that's not the case. But like we're all built slightly differently. Um, I do like to say that I think death and rebirth is possible for each and every single one of us in each moment. Even right now, I'm feeling super good. But if I were to be, you know, there's always a level of suffering in your body. There's always this longing for source, for home. Mm. And when you are in a lot of pain or in a lot of suffering, it's just when you're the closest to that source. And it's, it's like a wormhole. It's like a black hole. You go into it and it's not nothing on the other side. It's like there's another life on the other side. There's so much energy that becomes available. Mm. Speaking of death and rebirth, it was cool when I introduced you that I tried to get you to label yourself as something and you're basically like, I'm just doing me, you know? <laughs> and so many people are identified with a, like, oh, I'm a, yeah. I'm a published author, I'm a doctor, I'm a whatever it is. <laughs> and when I met you a few years ago, you were a very passionate dancer and that you built a sort of career around that mm-hmm. to which you you transformed into doing something entirely different. <laughs> so I'm curious as to what your process was around that, because that is something that is quite it's just like un, like unusual to you know, that's not something that people generally do people are like oh I have this career and I've worked so long on it I can't just give that up yeah it's this this was for me one of the biggest experiences of of really um being guided by life rather than having my mind in a driver's seat I was at the height of my dancing career I had just finished a month-long live-in dance school with five dancers from literally everywhere in the world I was making 7k euros at the moment from dancing and I just felt innately inside of myself, it's done. And I was like, uh, excuse me, but I'm fucking famous. <laughs> I'm good. I'm making money. I'm having fun. I'm like, nope, you're done. So I was like, okay, sure. I guess I can live with that. What do you want me to do? We're not going to tell you yet. <laughs> oh, shit. And it, it showed me how I was identified with a certain um, 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 label, a certain career, a certain thing that I am and I do, and I'm identified with the comfort of knowing what tomorrow brings, which is always a freaking illusion. I'm identified with um, the money, um, the status, blah, 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 everything. 
mostly I'm identify I'm I'm attached to being something in the world, to being of some sort of importance. And I think it's okay. I think we innately are attached to this because we are important, whatever it is that we do. But this showed me like your importance to the world, your value to the world can only come from a place of humility, which is are you willing to go out to 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 turn away from all the fame and the money and 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 the stage literally and to be a nobody for as long as it takes and that's what I did um, and I just sat and waited sat and waited and listened until something started to come through again and this was this is what it is um, and it's really showed me that I can live with that same level of detachment in all of my life and I think in relationships especially, it's really beautiful. Like, yes, I want you in my life and I love you. And yet, if our paths are separating, to not hold on. And that was a big lesson for me. Mm-hmm. So there was no, no, no reason or rhyme to it. It was just completely, um, yeah, my, the, in, the intuition, the inner calling, the inner guidance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think that so much of that comes from the ego. Like, our ego creates this kind of virtual safety net yeah. by categorizing. Like, we, we are disassociated from the terrifying reality that we have no idea what's going on. And if we actually <laughs> rest in that, it would be overwhelming mm-hmm. and terrifying. And you would wake up. <laughs> yeah. So instead, we we like to give ourselves these narrow little symbols that we can attach to mm-hmm. that, that give us that sense of security yeah. in a world that is that we are inherently vulnerable. Yeah, and then the we time. wonder why life keeps shaking us up and why we have to keep rebuilding that feeling of safety every time. It's because you can't. There is no safety in the world of whatever you can see or touch. There's only a safety in completely surrendering to this life is complete mystery and chaos and any idea that I have about tomorrow is just that, it's just an idea so again the freedom for me lies to be um, to feel safe in the unsafety in the not knowing which is completely opposite of course to how we're conditioned to do it do you use some kind of a, like, do you put your trust or your faith into something like that does, that enables you to then release the sense of security? If Do you have some kind of like a, a knowing of the eternal nature of yourself and therefore it's okay to let go of whatever conditions of your temporal self or something like that? Yes and no. I think the knowing is a little bit, is cute um from my human perspective i can think that i know that life is eternal and of course this is what i believe but to say that i actually truly know it it's um it it was a long especially with money even though i've never not had enough but it's it's such it's, it's such a fear frequency fear of survival yeah and i started noticing that i became increasingly more relaxed and trusting the more I put my faith in life itself, instead of praying for more money and trying to get a, trying to feel more secure through money. It's like, did George Carlin say that? It's like, it's the same as taping hamburgers to your body when you're hungry. It's like, at a certain point, you give up. And I gave up, I was like, okay. What I really want, once again, is to be free, free from this suffering. So, if no matter how much money I have, I'm not free, then I might as well try something else. And I, in that way, I surrendered. I was like, well, if, if I can only learn that I'm truly free by taking away all of my money and everything, do it. And I've let myself go down to zero. And I've, I, I put less and less and less effort into marketing myself or, or cre- you know, creating money. Um, I'm actually offering everything that I do for like one-tenth of the price. It's like... That's what true security, feeling of true security and safety does, for me at least. Um, 
And where I put my faith is in life, in love, in God, as you would call it. But it's not the kind of external authority and ex something external to us, like a God figure, something higher. This is kind of the vision of old school evolution, you know, like everything is linear. Um, God is something higher than us. The humans are competing with each other. What it is is that it's the fabric of life. God or higher source is not something outside of ourselves. It's actually permeating everything. It's an organizing principle. So that's where I put my faith and my trust. Mm. Awesome. Yeah, I think that that's a pretty good place to end this conversation. Just, yeah, to try to be as honest with where we're at and how life is unfolding and to put our trust and faith in that rather than this sort of deities of our culture mm -hmm. like fame, wealth, status, recognition, I like adoration, etc. I like that. Yeah. Or false gods. Yeah. Thanks, babe. I had fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs>